In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> so how's your optimism holding up these days? Some days it's harder than others, isn't it? You know, I'm reminded this Christmas season of my grandparents telling me about the year they were married. They were married in the summer of 1914. They were both 18 years old, just barely legal. And World War I broke out a month later in August. And it was at that time, Great Britain and Germany that were largely in the battle, but there was a lot of fear that the United States would join that war as well. And 18-year-old men might find themselves headed overseas. They remembered their first Christmas together, and I remember them saying there was really not very much to be optimistic about that year. And today, you think about other places like Afghanistan or Iraq or Sudan or Syria, where there's a constant presence of fear of terrorism. There seems to be unending strife, various groups at each other's throats, civil war always shredding the fabric of those countries, and of course disease, COVID for sure, but also others, malaria and cholera and HIV shredding their bodies. How can anyone be optimistic in a time like that? Of course, for most of us here in North America, we don't experience the daily uh, devastation, do we, of famine and terrorism. Fortunately, we don't. But we certainly share conflict among people and groups, racial and ethnic strife, and of course, COVID. And this Advent, a sense of gloom tends to hang in the air all over the world, and even across this country. Indeed, it seems to me optimism is in short supply these days. And so this morning's passage that we just heard from the book of Isaiah, it's from chapter 65, it's toward the end of Isaiah's uh, writings, and it was a time when there was a thick darkness hanging over ancient Israel. For so long, too long, Israel had looked the other way when faced with injustice among its people. They rejected the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the consequence is what they were suffering. They saw their society crumble as they were then defeated by foreign powers. They ignored injustice and turned from God, and their society was crushed. So what happened? Well, many of those Israelites were taken captive. They were relocated to Babylon, present-day Baghdad, 500 miles from where they lived. And Isaiah is talking about the time when this long exile, it was 70 years that they spent in Babylon, Isaiah is telling us when that time had finally ended and some of the people were now making the long 500-mile trek largely across desert back home to Jerusalem. However, when they returned, they did not find it like when they left. The community had been ravaged. Homes were empty for the last 70 years. You can picture it, vines clinging to walls, collapsed roofs of the homes where people once lived. A city left in ruins, largely uninhabited for 70 years. Their homes, their infrastructure, their whole faith community was now in tatters. Everything had to be rebuilt. Not just the buildings, but their lives. Their community had to be rebuilt. 
It had to look like a daunting task to these people. They were demoralized. They were not hopeful of their future. Optimism was in very short supply in those days. And so to this beaten down people, God through Isaiah speaks a fresh and startling word. Verses 17 through 19. He says to them, I am about to create a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not even be remembered or come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I'm creating now, for I'm about to create Jerusalem to be a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem. I will delight in my people. No more will the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cries of distress. Isaiah is giving the people a glimpse of God's dream for his world. Those painful memories that make every day feel like slogging through a tangled swamp, those days are going to be forgotten. The harsh experiences that colored everything that they see, it's going to be blotted out. All the wounds that you've suffered, the hypocrisy, the violence, won't feed your cynicism anymore. And the suffering won't just be over, God said. It shall not even be remembered or come to mind. It'll be forgotten like it never happened. God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. That's a promise. Now he goes on and this is not going to be a return to some picturesque past that we remember. No matter how much they might romanticize the golden eras of their past. It won't be like that. We're not returning to the days of King David or King Solomon. It won't be like that. We're not returning to the fragile peace of the carefree 1920s or the 1950s. Oh no, it's going to pass all of that like we have never known. God's optimism is going to again rule the day. Wow, I mean, even Isaiah had a hard time finding the words to describe this. He had to use poetry to even explain it. He says, the wolf and the lamb will graze together. And the lion, the lion, the lion becomes a vegetarian. All creation is going to live in harmony again. These words of Isaiah, these passages describing God's plan for his world have instilled hope in countless generations over thousands of years. It was these words that Americans and Europeans turned toward in World War I. It's what we turned to in 1941 as Pearl Harbor was attacked. It was back to these words. It was to these words that the people of Europe turned during the 12th century plagues. It was to these words that the people of Great Britain turned as London was being bombed night after night after night in World War II. It was these words that Christians in Iraq turned just three years ago when ISIS was destroying their homes, their churches, and their people. It was to these very words of Isaiah that slaves would cling as they dreamed of freedom. When God's people despair about the state of affairs, violence and poverty, disease and suffering, injustice and oppression, these words inspire us too. They inspire us to look beyond the present to a time when God's kingdom and his values will take root throughout the world, throughout this nation, throughout our lives. 
Because deep within every human soul, I think, is a longing for peace and serenity and security and an absence of conflict. I don't think it makes any different, any difference our background or where we live. Everyone just wants to live their life in peace and security. That, that yearning unites us all, everyone, the entire world. <clears throat> and yet while we long for that, too often we allow selfish desires and bitterness, pain over past sufferings, we allow them to take priority in our life. We let those things whittle away at our optimism for a new day. And so what we end up doing is we grasp on to some paltry vision, a dream, a simple dream, a lesser dream that's just, what's good for me? Regardless of what the impact is on others, I'm just going to focus on what's good for me. And so what we end up doing is we give up on this grand dream. We abandon optimism and we settle for just taking care of ourselves. Or we can be tempted to just sit passively on the sidelines, just wait for God to come and finally rebuild the world. Let me know when it's ready, Lord. I'll be right here. I'm keeping my head down in the meantime, just taking care of myself. But Isaiah's vision makes clear that the healing of this world is not just God's construction project. The people and God will have to strive together. Isaiah says, God will create new heavens and a new earth. And then he goes on, they, that's the people, shall build houses and inhabit them. They, the people, that's us, shall plant vineyards and will eat their fruit. You see, God is not going to accomplish all of this without us. I said it a few weeks back. Let me repeat it again. If you wonder what your purpose is, this is it. Seeking out where God is at work rebuilding his world and jumping in to help as you can. Where is this happening? Where is God rebuilding his world? Where is he rebuilding lives? Where is he rooting out loneliness and poverty and hunger? Where is he rooting out depression and addictions? Where is God out and about healing what ails this world? Go there. Lend a hand there. We have gifts, each of us, and God needs our help. See, Isaiah's prophecy challenges us to help God make his vision come to fruition. But as we know, this will not be a cakewalk, will it? There will be obstacles. There will be those who will work against it. <clears throat> but we are optimistic because God promised that that vision will come about. He didn't say it might. He said it will. And our optimism, you see, comes not from our efforts. Our optimism comes from holding on to and trusting in God's promises. He always holds true to his promises. That's where our optimism comes from. So how does this work? Let's get practical. Through our own prayer, yours and mine, through time when we soak in God's Word, the Holy Spirit weaves God's messages into our thoughts. And in our mind, God's words then have to contend with all the other ideas that rattle around in our brains, our political views, the philosophical notions that we have, maybe even parental voices that we still are hearing maybe messages from our culture. All those things now contend with God's word for our attention, 
That's what goes on up here. How do we sort it all out? Worship. Worship helps us to distinguish God's voice from all the other voices that we hear. During worship, God's whispers right into the depths of our souls urges us to take the path that will lead to his good will. Oh, there will be other voices that will try to divert us to a different route. I'm so busy. That doesn't sound like much fun at all. Maybe I should do that another time. All those voices. But when we embrace God's urgings, that's when we start to see new opportunities arise in our life. But it's hard, isn't it? This isn't simple, deciding on which voice to follow. But knowing which voice to follow is absolutely critical. Because the path that embraces God's promises leads us to love and joy and hope and optimism. The other path leads us toward shallowness and cynicism and anxiety and pessimism. Well, why would anybody choose that path? Because that path presents us too often with glittering images of personal glory. Quick comfort, that would be really good for me. Easy security, instant gratification, that's where that road leads. But here's the catch. The path that focuses on just what's good for me ultimately ends up being unfulfilling. Everything we think just worrying about ourselves, or everything we think that will bring us, lets us down. It's unfulfilling. Because personal well-being, yours and mine, is always intertwined with the well-being of other people. Think about that. Our well-being is always intertwined with the well-being of other people. See, God wants us to covenant with him to work together with him to transform this world. Promise to work together and together change this world into his kingdom. Let me close with a story. It's a story about a woman named Alexandra Morrison. Alexandra Morrison was a United States interrogator at the detention facility in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. She worked with detainees. They were largely terrorists, murderers, and rapists. She never forgot for a moment, she said, that given the chance, she knew they would kill her or anyone else in order to escape. Some of them had committed crimes so horrific that Alex said she couldn't sleep, wondering what would happen if they ever did become free. But this wasn't the only reason she couldn't sleep. She had also spent 18 months prior to this as a soldier serving in Iraq before her time in Cuba. She wanted to make a difference at Guantanamo. But night after night, she couldn't sleep. Absolutely plagued with dreams back from her time in Iraq. Nightmares about explosions and screaming that would wake her, startle her in the night. And once being sleepless for almost 48 hours straight, she started to hallucinate. And she panicked and she began to think that people were now planting bombs outside her home where she lived in Guantanamo. And she lay awake in a cold, anxious sweat. When she went back to work, she said she began to meet with her clients, and she called them clients. That's what she called the detainees to whom she was assigned. And she wondered how many of them were also still screaming at night like she was. Now, her job was to obtain information from these uh, prisoners and in the process keep U.S. soldiers safe. She and her clients would meet. They'd meet every day. They would play dominoes. She would bring chocolates. They would talk. 
She hoped she could learn something useful. There was one detainee. His name was Mustafa. He had committed numerous murders, did things he wished he could take back, he said. Then one day, the discussion turned serious, and he said, you know everything about me, Alex. Why don't you hate me? His question, she said, stopped her cold, and she said, well, everyone has done things in their past they're not very proud of. I know I have, but I know that God still expects me to love him with all my heart, soul, and mind, and to love my neighbor as myself, and that means you. And Mustafa started to cry, and later she writes, accepting that man, Mustafa, helped me accept myself again. My clients, she said, will never know this, but my year with them helped me finally heal, and my nightmares stop. You see, sometimes it isn't even that we're called to do something so different than what we do already, but we're called to do it with different eyes, to take it now and do what we do from a different perspective, from God's perspective. And when we do that, it actually changes us. When our bitterness begins to turn into compassion, our judgment into acceptance, when our hate starts to change into love, there is power in God's love. Embrace it and live it. You see, if we strive for justice, if we extend compassion and live in hope in God's optimism, God's optimism, he is always leading us to a better day, always. And he's doing it right now. Amen.